So I realize that this is a uh, very mixed audience, and uh, I know that I'm going to be interrupted, and I'm not going to get through my slides. Believe me, I'm not worried about uh, doing that. Uh, I'm only trying to uh, live up to the standard because my wife is in the back of the hallway. She's a psychologist. She knows as much about uh, the diseases of the brain as I do, and I'm just trying not to screw up in front of her. <laughs> It's incredibly important to understand the brain. It even made the State of the Union message this year. The idea that we could approach the brain in much of the same spirit as the human genome was approached. Why would we want to do this? Well, there are two very simple reasons. We're really interested in knowing who we are and how and why we do what we do, and that all stems from the brain. And secondly, the diseases of the brain Alzheimer's, autism, epilepsy are a tremendous burden on society. And if we don't manage to bring these under control, even if we do a good job politically, and this is always debatable, uh, we will have a difficulty with managing the ever-increasing age of the population as it approaches the state of the movie M.O.R., which my wife and I saw and was really heartrending. Um, Diseases of the brain are probably more cruel than many other types of diseases. So we face both an intellectual challenge and a practical challenge. The intellectual challenge is to take the structure of the brain, which is made up of absolutely fantastic numbers of neurons, which we can study in great detail and make sense of what all of this structure is about. So this is done by array tomography by a colleague of mine, Stephen Smith. It involves reconstructing the structure of the brain from many, many thin sections. And when you build it up, you, what you see is that a neuron, uh, a pyramidal cell uh, in the cortex, is this entirely gorgeous structure full of the branches that a tree would have, uh, tree trunk, <coughs> roots, uh, and many connections to other cells. And so the question is, how are we going to make sense of this? And what are the challenges we face? And how do we see the forest for the trees? Well, the main problem is that we know a lot about um, genes and proteins. Uh, at the molecular level, we know uh, exactly how a cell fires an action potential or a synapse communicates information from one nerve cell to another. But the challenge is to relate what we know about genes and proteins to the connections between cells called synapses, to the function of individual neurons that the synapses drive, all the way up to the behavior that could be seen in an individual or in an animal that we're studying. And this involves understanding the relationship between neurons and the circuits that they fall in and the networks that they constitute, finally building up the structure of a whole brain. So if you're a <coughs> physicist, how many of you are actually physicists? Okay, and probably not solid state physicists, but more <coughs> theoretical physicists, right? Not many of you, are, are any of you working on integrated circuits, transistors, semiconductor theory, <laughs> quantum dots? Okay, so are you involved in the origin of the universe? Or, or string theory, or things like that. Okay, so you're far Not away from the, the computer. You're, you're probably all know something about computers, or think you do, and therefore it makes sense to make the computer analogy to say, just because you understood the p-n junction, or the relationship between two pieces of geranium that makes a transistor, doesn't mean you're going to understand how your phone works. And reaching all those levels involves a tremendous amount of engineering and putting together of lots and lots of principles, lots of circuits. Imagine that played out in the most powerful computer in the universe that we know of, and that is the brain, um, in terms of its size uh, to function ratio. Uh, how are we going to do that? So what we need to do is to take the abundance of genetic data that is coming out all the time uh, in focusing on diseases like autism. We have to, we understand uh, how neurons fire spikes and how synapses signal. Some of the work that uh, Jerry and Lorna worked on, we understand, but we're trying to understand circuits, which are the critical intermediate, this sort of no man's land 
between the genes and the proteins and the behavior. And ultimately, uh, we are going to try to tackle this as a community. Uh, and even though uh, the press is very anxious to see a perfect analogy between the great magnification of scientific leverage between the Human Genome Project and the outcomes of that, I think that understanding the brain is going to be even more difficult than cracking the genome. The genome is a linear sequence. It's just an array of, of, of uh, information. The human brain is a three-dimensional object that has to be understood on many, many different levels. And part of our task as a community, as scientists and engineers, is to find ways of communicating with the public what we know and what we don't know, and how we can get the public to help us in reaching those goals. So my specific focus in this lecture, and indeed in much of my lab, is to understand the human challenge that autism presents. And I'm struggling with this pointer because you can't see it, right? It's it's screen pointer, but it doesn't work very well here. And I suppose one possibility is yep, for me to use this. Why don't I try this? So autism is characterized by three cardinal features. Children who have autism are generally averse to social situations. They prefer inanimate objects. They tend to perseverate to do the same thing over and over again. They avoid novelty and they engage in what's called stereotypical behavior. It might consist of playing with a windmill or something like that for hours or at least many, many minutes on end. And finally, they have uh, a loss of the ability to communicate. These are very broad generalizations. There's a whole range of symptoms, and it ranges from very high-functioning individuals to those who are severely mental retarded. But within this range, all of these three common features hold. One of the reasons this is of such great importance to us is that the incidence of autism is on a steep rise. And I don't think you need to be a mathematician to recognize an exponentially rising curve. Um, it, it does depend on the method of interpretation. It de does depend on the testing procedure that's used. But most people who are experts in the field would agree that indeed the increase in people's ability to recognize autism and the willingness of people to admit that their child has autism rather than hiding them away uh, in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a dark room uh, is increasing, but that's only one factor involved. Since we believe the human genome just doesn't change that fast, the obvious possibility is that there must be something environmental that is influencing uh, the incidence of autism. So even if you allow for the, the factors that you mentioned, uh, it would still be a, a sharply rising curve. So this comes home to me in a personal way, because this young man, uh, Harry, who is now 13, uh, is the son of my former business manager at Stanford. And her office was right next to mine. And she came to Stanford because she saw my name on a website and realized that I might be interested in autism. She moved from Harvard to Stanford, took a part-time job, and spends the other part of her time taking care of her son and her uh, normal daughter. Harry was classified with autism and epilepsy at a relatively early age. And through a series of clinicians, some of whom got what he had and some who didn't, eventually he was characterized as having PDD-NOS a particular form of autism. Uh, and eventually, he wound up in a autism clinic, the Morgan Autism Center in San Jose, and is doing moderately well. But I personally experienced meeting him because when he would visit his mom, I could hear his cries uh, through the air conditioning system that linked our two offices. And eventually, I came to meet him and saw all of the characteristic features and unwillingness to communicate an aversion to making eye contact, and a general tendency to do the same thing over and over again. <coughs> Harry was lucky to be taken care of by a clinician named Marina uh, uh, Vazerman, uh, who uh, had a long experience at NYU. And in fact, uh, she's his favorite clinician. I bring this up just because uh, uh, many of you probably know people who have autism. Uh, it's a debilitating thing, both for the individual and for the families. It varies widely in its expression. Uh, but let's face it, uh, something that takes 
the personality away from uh, a child at, at a relatively early age is one of the most difficult things to deal with as uh, uh, one of the afflictions that mankind faces. So the obvious question is, what can basic science contribute to try to understand more about the disease and perhaps find ways of at least ameliorating it? So this is a slide uh, taken from the work of Thomas Bourgeron, uh, who was the keynote speaker at the recent safari meeting. And each of the symbols here, you don't need to know about the names, uh, represents a protein, a product of a gene that is implicated either in autism or in a disease related to autism. And the point of the picture is not all the details of all the names. The point is that this is a cartoon of a synapse, a connection between nerve cells. This is the presynaptic side, and this is the postsynaptic side. And the synapse is absolutely littered with gene products that have been implicated in some form of disease that is somehow related to autism. Also, there is a group over here that are genes that are in the cell body, in fact, in the nucleus, where the DNA is used to uh, read out the code for proteins. Quick question. Yes. Is this a typical synapse or a particular synapse? This is drawn as a generic synapse because the authors don't actually know exactly which synapse is affected. And the proteins... Typical or generic? It's meant to be vague, but the proteins that are affected are found at many synapses. And since the gene is affected, it's not something that happens at the last moment after the protein is made, we have the idea that those proteins are affected throughout the brain. Now, which of those synapses is the one that's most critical for producing the autism? We don't know, and that's what we would like to find out. And there's an allusion here to an inhibitory synapse because this little outcropping here, which is not really drawn uh, very accurately uh, because the, 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 the GABAergic synapses are probably uh, on the smooth part of the dendrite, but this is a representation of the fact that some inhibitory synapses are also affected. So here's the first case for me to leave someone behind that I don't want to leave behind. There are two kinds of synapses, one excitatory and one inhibitory. The excitatory ones use one type of transmitter called glutamate, and the other use another transmitter called GABA. And both types of synapses have been implicated in autism. And at the end of the talk, I'm going to tell you that oxytocin specifically affects inhibitory GABAergic neurons. So have I left anybody behind yet? Nobody's asleep. And uh, yeah, OK, Michael. I assume it's a human. Synapse, the one you are showing me, or is it a, a, a mouse synapse? It, the synapse, uh, if you look in, in the well, well, microscope at a human synapse gather. and a mouse synapse, you would not be able to tell them apart. So it is a very sad thing because we take great pride, we're very anthropomorphic, that uh, humans are special, but the difference does not appear at the level of the individual synapse. It has something to do with the way the synapses are organized. And uh, these proteins are typical of uh, the synapse of uh, people suffering from autism? So or this is uh, they are just here in greater abundance? Um, we don't think that the numbers of proteins are very different in the autistic brain or the normal brain. If we look at the brain of an autistic individual, and a normal individual, we can hardly tell them apart. We think it's down at some functional level or a more microscopic level. And I'm not trying to say that every one of these proteins is affected in an autistic individual. In fact, there are about a thousand genes that have been implicated in genetic studies by people like Mike Wigler and others. And they contribute in various ways to autism. Uh, and we don't exactly know what the mix is. Yeah, I love the questions. Keep going. But is there something resembling autism in mice? Uh, that's what I'm going to come to. I'm going to show you a mouse model of autism and actually take you through the behavior of the mouse. Obviously, they're not going to sing arias and uh, play the piano, but they do have behavioral aspects that look a lot like autism uh, with a certain eye of faith. 
So our approach to this has been to focus on one particular protein. And Jerry already alluded to the idea that calcium channels uh, were a subject of, of great interest to me uh, at various stages of my career. Our strategy has been to focus on this particular protein uh, because it produces a form of autism that is highly penetrant. And I'll explain that in what I mean by that in a moment. So our strategy, and I'm now talking about the work of Patrick Botter, who's here in the audience. Patrick is a board-trained psychiatrist uh, who studied in Switzerland and took the brave step of joining our lab at Stanford and now at NYU. And he's been uh, spearheading, along with uh, Natasha Turco, uh, our behavioral work. Scott Owen is a Stanford graduate student who studied the oxytocin part. And we took the strategy that we would try to approach autism and other psychiatric disorders in the context of neuronal signaling. In other words, rooting our approaches to the disease in terms of basic science. And the way we would do it is a three-part strategy. First, we would look at some rare forms of autism, not the common garden variety form, but rare forms that can be traced to a defect in a single gene. And we would study these with mouse models. Secondly, we would study what those proteins actually did under normal cell biological circumstances to see what their role was in order to try to understand how they were embedded in the entire life of the cell. And finally, we would focus on uh, the action of a candidate therapeutic agent, and we wound up choosing oxytocin. So let's begin with the first part, which is to make a mouse model of autism, as you uh, just asked. Jerry already alluded to this. This is a disease called Timothy syndrome. Timothy is not the name of a young boy, although it, it affects boys. Timothy is the name of a nurse practitioner named Catherine Timothy, who was working at the University of Utah in a cardiac clinic. And she studied children who came in with an abnormal heartbeat that was extra long as measured by the interval between the Q wave of the EKG and the T wave of the EKG. That's the duration that the heart muscle is contracting and depolarized. And that long inter that interval, the QT interval, goes wrong in kids who have certain types of heart disease. So the kids came into the clinic, it was a famous cardiac clinic, and she noticed that in addition to having this cardiac problem, some of the kids were behaving unusually. Well, it turns out that Timothy syndrome, as she characterized it, is actually a multi-system disorder where the kids not only have a long heartbeat and autism, they also have slightly unusual faces, and they have webbed fingers and an immune deficiency. And later, she teamed up uh, uh, with Mike, Mike uh, 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 Keating at Harvard, and they discovered that the, this whole syndrome, this multi-system defect, was caused by a single base change, a single codon change, in um, uh, a particular type of calcium channel called CACNA1C, which I will call CACNA1C. It's the name of a calcium channel. And it turns out that this is caused by a single amino acid change from a glycine to an arginine. That was enough to produce all of these effects. How could yes? They, how could they confirm that that was the, the sole cause of the syndrome? They sequenced the DNA from the individual and found that one of the alleles, one of the, one of the copies from mom or dad, was altered. Then they sequenced the DNA from mom and dad and found that mom and dad did not have that mutation. They sequenced the siblings and the siblings did not have the mutation. So the interpretation is that the mutation occurred sporadically. And they could be very sure about the DNA sequencing. That's the beauty of DNA sequencing. It's very digital and very reliable. So it appeared that this was a sporadic mutation that occurred spontaneously individual in the individual presumably uh, you know, in either the sperm or the egg, and the individual is unlucky enough to get the disease, even though mom and dad and sibs did not have it. So the statistics then of saying you have the mutation and you have autism, or you don't have the mutation and you don't have the autism, are very, very powerful. And you do a chi-square test, and you come with, up with a p-value 
of 10 to the minus 8th that your interpretation is incorrect. And that's just because it's so simple. There's, you either have the G or you have the R, and, uh, and the parents don't, and the parents don't have autism. So this is a sporadic uh, case of autism, and it's not like the ones that normally affect most of the world. So there's no attempt here at studying common garden variety autism. We're simply going to go for a rare situation where we can really understand it. And then the article of faith here is that if we understand this, we will then have a toehold in understanding autism in general. And there's no way of proving that until one has actually accomplished that. And so it's just one of those bets that you make. Jerry. Sure. It's worth mentioning, in addition to the, to the precision and the sequencing, one chief criterion is to see it in other people, some recurrence. So this is such a rare event, if you see it in two children or three, it becomes more and more convincing that this variation is the cause of the syndrome. So right. you place a high score on the recurrence. Right. And it must be in maybe 40, 50 families in the world at large. So it's a very rare disease. Curing it is not going to uh, you know, uh, help a whole lot of people, although those people obviously are, would be extremely happy if you could figure out uh, what the basis of it was. What is a calcium channel? Um, a calcium channel is a protein that sits in the surface of a cell, in the membrane of a cell. Uh, it's a protein that has a hole in the middle of it, and the hole is normally closed. When the membrane potential changes by 0.02 volts, Jerry has broken me into using volts rather than millivolts, uh, but about 0.02 volts, the channel switches from a closed state to an open state. And in that open state, the calcium ions, which are very abundant outside and very rare inside, simply move down their uh, electrochemical gradient. They move from where they're abundant to the, where they're not. And that not only carries positive charge, two charges per calcium ion, but it also carries a signal. Because the inside of the cell is so deprived of calcium that a small amount of calcium entry makes a huge difference in changing the concentration. And there are a whole beautiful family of proteins that have been evolved to say, oh, calcium's here, and now I can change my shape and bind the things and, and signal things. And now we'll talk about that in a moment. But how much in delay do you have to calcium channels if a heartbeat? I've got it roughly, the order of magnitude. Okay, so if the voltage changes because of other ion flows, the calcium channel will open in two milliseconds, <coughs> and it will stay open for a while, but then it'll gradually shut itself off. And I show that in the very next panel here. <coughs> which describes the turning on. You see it takes place very, very quickly. And turning on, for conventional reasons, is shown downward rather than upward. Just got to get used to that. And so this is turning on. And then if you leave the heart muscle or the nerve cell depolarized, in other words, the voltage stays changed, then the channel gradually shuts itself off. And that's for eco ecological purposes. You don't want to waste all your calcium. You don't want to flood the cell with calcium because for a long time, that, for too much calcium can be toxic. So the channel has an auto shut off mechanism that it comes by the fancy name of inactivation. And the auto shut off mechanism is defective in Timothy syndrome. So instead of shutting off with a half time of 50 milliseconds, uh, it hardly shuts off uh, or only, is only half shut off in 400 milliseconds. So it's a huge effect. You can easily tell the difference between this family of <coughs> currents and that family of currents. And so the obvious inference is that because the channel is defective and auto shut off, it may allow too much calcium to come in. Usually calcium is good, it, it drives good things, but too much of a good thing is not a good thing. And that may be the source of the abnormal heartbeat, and perhaps it's the source of the autism. We don't know yet. Yes. You described the symptoms. Which ones are autism? Okay. So I didn't actually. I showed you all the other symptoms. Right. The autism was characterized by an expert in the field, and she saw all the, the cardinal features: communication, perseveration. So you just didn't mention. Yeah. Yeah.
Leslie, did you have a question? No. Okay. So, uh, so now you me you mentioned altered uh, gene expression at the bottom on the right hand side. The change, the alteration is in the rate, either slowing or speeding up, or the gene somehow now uh, causes uh, synthesis of, of different uh, proteins. What's uh, the alteration here? Um, we don't know completely. Uh, you we think it could be the latter, that now the same gene produces a slightly different protein? Uh, we think not, because the nature of the protein is encoded by the DNA, yeah. and uh, we think it's more likely to be the level of the protein that's yeah. changed. And I'm going to tell you about how too much or too little calcium will affect the pattern of gene expression in a moment. And that's going to be in the middle part of the talk. So, uh, any other questions? So over the last couple of days, I've been telling Julia that I was going to give this lecture, and I think she's been really worried that I was going to blow it and leave the audience completely behind. Everyone was going to be asleep and unhappy. So I've been trying to prepare and sort of acting a little cocky that I could do this. But then I realized, you know, she had a point that I was uh, sort of uh, sailing into very dangerous waters. So I decided that I would write um, the questions that I thought I would be asked. And if you feel shy, and I, I don't really see many shy people, but if you feel really shy, you don't actually have to shut out, shout out the question. You can just shout out the number. Okay? Like number five. I'll take number five. Okay? And I just want to point out to you that um, most of these questions have actually been asked. What is a calcium channel? It's a hole that opens in response to a depolarization. Why is it multi-system? Because calcium channels are found in the heart and in the brain and other places. If the disease is rare, is it worth studying? Well, that's the article of faith. If we really understand one form of autism, we'll have a clue to all the others. And we can't prove that. How did you get the number 75%? By doing chi-square statistics looking at the parents. Is it an ongoing functional problem, or is it a problem of hardwiring? Honestly, we don't know. And if we could figure that out using this animal model, uh, that would be a step forward. And finally, is there a pharmaceutical that would help? Well, calcium channels are actually blocked by blood pressure medicine by calcium channel blockers. And in fact, drug companies reap a billion dollars, bring in a billion dollars of income every year uh, based on those very same calcium channel blockers. They're FDA approved. They're taken by uh, your relatives. In fact, some of you may be using them. And so they're safe. And we could test them on the Timothy syndrome animal. And we are going to do that. But along the way, we need to know a little bit more before we know exactly how to do it. Thomas? That's number four? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a tough one, because <laughs> um, there aren't many genes that are as penetrant as 75%. But there are other uh, defects that are pretty darn penetrant. And I would say maybe there are four or five of them, and all of them are synaptic. Now, that doesn't mean that only synaptic proteins can produce autism. It means that the attention has been focused on genes whose functions are known and which can easily fit into people's research programs. Uh, and so we do know of other proteins like uh, neuroligin <coughs> that are very penetrant as well. So it's not the only one. Uh, and, but it's, it's a very, very logical one for reasons I'm going to describe. Nick, I, I interpret that question to ask are there other genes that might replace CACNAC1 to take over its function? Is that what you meant? Well, I'm, I, I'm, yes, but I, I, I <laughs> this like is your Jerry Fishbach auditorium. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I like your answer, so, but, but, but yes, that was my well, the, the question of why other calcium channel genes don't take over is a critical question. I'm going to come to that in a few minutes. Okay, maybe about ten minutes. Yes. So this does not have uh, this does not have exponential growth, and it does have a genetic explanation. Are any of the ones with genetic explanations having exponential growth? You should have slide where most are. Um, the genes 
that we're talking about have been in uh, mammals for uh, mi literally millions and millions of years. No, no, and what, what he means is, are there more increasing cases of obviously genetic caused autism? Yes, which would yes. Okay, so, so you mean if you take Timothy syndrome and the, the Norexin gene and, and all the ones which have a very clear etiology and lump them all together, does that explain this? Yes. No. But you don't have much. Uh, they're so rare. This they're so time. rare. They're down in the baseline. Mm -hmm. No, but he's also thinking of the growth. You see, if it's a, if it's it's hard to imagine uh, something that's strictly caused <coughs> by genetics to be growing in the population. Right. Since, as you point out, our genes haven't changed all that much. Right. So uh, I think that's what the okay. question Thank you does. for the interpretation. And uh, it's a great question. Uh, yes, our genes aren't changing uh, fast enough. So the changes in the DNA code itself are unlikely. But there are other aspects of that are sort of, uh, uh, they're called epigenetics. I can't say quasi-genetics because that would make it sound like I don't believe it. Epigenetics means that there are marks on the DNA that are not part of the DNA code itself. It's not Watson Crick code. It's something like a methylation or some other mark. And those could be changing. And there's increasing evidence that they're environmental factors. If your mom gets the flu, uh, that causes an immune response. And some beautiful work by Paul Patterson has shown that uh, that immune response can trigger things at the right time in development that could lead to autism. So there are many other things going on besides DNA itself. Yes? I have a question about uh, the mice model. There was recent research, for example, in sepsis, that uh, raised questions about the adequacy of using uh, mice as a model, and uh, that research seemed to imply that actually sepsis in mice is really different from sepsis in humans. And there were two other... I'm going to concede right off the bat that, Michael. Pardon me? Uh, I'm going to concede right off the bat that the behavior that you're about to see is not equivalent to behavior in humans. But uh, let me show you the behavior, and then let's talk about how the it question has is also about the mechanism. So an eminent uh, cancer researcher at the uh, Mass General told me, uh, I'm healthy. But he said, if you were a mouse, then you uh, chances you know, of overcoming uh, cancer would be much better than now that you are human. Yes. <laughs> so there is a disparity between the models and, and <coughs> the people we are really interested in. People I think those are sense. all perfectly valid points. And in fact, what we're going to need to do is use animal models like mice because the genetics uh, for a mammal are just unmatched. Figure out as much as we can, and then when we run out of steam, uh, we're going to have to either take the principles we learn in the mouse and find a way to apply them in the human. Or if we're talking about pharmaceuticals, and a pharmaceutical idea that is generated by a mouse. We're going to have to try them out on other animals besides mice that are closest, closer to us. But at the stage we're at, where we're still exploring things, the function of cells, uh, a spike in a mouse uh, uh, neuron, uh, you would not be able to tell it apart from a human neuron. The synapse, they're very much the same. And in fact, their genomes are 99% the same. So it's sort of at the last bit when you're dealing with, let's say, uh, cancer or sepsis or something like that, where the drugs might work in a, in a mouse but not work in a human. We're, we're expecting that. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why large pharma are very leery of working on the nervous system. So part of what we have to do is make the case, using the mice, that we really understand the basic mechanism of the disease. And then when we start getting practical of making drugs and so on and so forth, take the steps from mouse to, let's say, um, uh, other animals, uh, and maybe even non-human primates. And I think one of the things that's going to be a task for the future is to find a uh, feasible version of a non-human primate that will be used in 
at exactly the right moment in as conservative a way as possible, we're going to need something like that. Okay, let me show you the mouse model. So uh, this is Patrick Botter's work, and I'm going to go through it relatively quickly. Uh, this shows a test where uh, a home cage is used to study the behavior of the mouse. And all we're really doing is tracking, tracking the location of the mouse. And for four days, the mouse gets a choice between a shelter and a place where it gets uh, water and food. Think of it as the cafeteria. Then, after those four days, the mouse is given a choice, an additional choice, between an empty wire cup. It's sort of like a pencil holder turned upside down. Uh, or a pencil cup with a mouse that the object mouse has never seen before. And so this uh, uh, newcomer uh, is a natural attractant for wild-type animals. Wild-type animals will spend most of their time here. But in the Timothy syndrome mouse... Sorry? What is this object? Sorry? What is the object attractive to wild-type mice? The, it's another mouse. Another mouse. Okay. Live mouse. It's a live mouse that the subject mouse has never seen before, and it's a potential new friend. Uh, and of course, it's not uh, you know kind of a bully mouse. It's it's someone that. She bound to embrace why this space. How she's bound physically. How stays there? Why it stays in this um, Because there's a pencil cup that's made out of wire mesh that's turned upside down. It's visible, it's visible, but not... It's visible, it's smellable, it's not touchable, and, and it's not fightable. Okay? Well, the heat map, which looks like, you know, kind of a, a democratic Republican thing, uh, basically tells you the whole story. Uh, red means it's where the Timothy syndrome animals like to be, and it turns out that the Timothy syndrome animals prefer to be near the empty pencil cup, and the normal animals to be near uh, the uh, newcomer mouse. And this holds true if you average over uh, two dozen mice. It also holds true if you look individually, mouse by mouse. The two distributions are quite separate. The normal mice will prefer the social uh, stimulus, and the Timothy syndrome animals will prefer the inanimate stimulus. What's the time axis? Um, this axis? <coughs> Uh, that's to describe the uh, the uh, the preference. Uh, so ten to the zero, uh, since this is a mathematical crowd, you know that means one. Uh, one is a ratio of equal time. Okay, and the more red it is, uh, the more the uh, mutant animals prefer to be there. So uh, red refers to the ratio of the time spent by the Timothy syndrome animals uh, divided by the time spent by the wild type animals. And that analysis is done pixel by pixel. So the fact that this is all red uh, either means it's all Republican or that it's where you know, all the animals would prefer to be. OK. So this is an example of uh, social behavior. In another test, which uh, Patrick dreamed up, uh, he allowed the animal to uh, roam around uh, in their normal cage where they're getting water, food, and shelter. And then suddenly, uh, unsuspectingly, uh, they're encountered with a sudden annex chamber. Now, if you give scientists an extra lap, uh, they will go for that right away. But mice are shy creatures. And I could show you a movie, but I'll save the time. And they spend a lot of time going right up to the entrance, sticking their nose there, checking it out, but not going there. And in fact, there's a huge difference between the Timothy syndrome animals and the wild type animals. The Timothy syndrome animals uh, take uh, more than twice as long to make their first entry. And they spend about half as much time in the new environment. They prefer the old environment. So this is an example of aversion to novelty, one of the other types of characteristics that you see in um, uh, autistic individuals. Question. Yes. How did you find these Timothy syndrome mice? Uh, we, if they're so rare, how, how did you locate them? Okay, so we, uh, they were made by scientists who use technology that allows them to swap one piece of DNA for another piece of DNA. So these are man-made. And there's an interesting story. They were actually made by a collaborator of ours, an old friend of mine in the University of Buffalo, 
who is still a cardiac electrophysiologist. And he wanted to study the long heartbeat. He made the mice and then was enormously disappointed that there was no cardiac problem at all. They did not have long QT syndrome. It turns out that mice have a very short heartbeat. It's because their hearts beat at 600 times uh, per minute, 10 times per second. And the individual heartbeat doesn't last long enough for that shutting off of the calcium channel to matter. It's another ion channel, a potassium channel, that terminates the heartbeat. And it's irrelevant whether the calcium flux would have gone on for a long time because the voltages change back to the original resting level. So he was very unlucky with the cardiac problem, but he was fortunate to team up with Patrick. And then we got our dramatic result. So this is a test uh, that we learned from a colleague at NYU called Charles Hofer. It's called the water Y maze. The idea is that the animal is given uh, a choice between turning right or turning left. And in one of the branches of the maze, there is a platform that the animal cannot see, but can feel, and will allow the animal to come out high and dry. So you start the animal at this end, and they learn by trial and error to turn right every time. And by the time they've tried this in a number of uh, four different blocks of trials, all of them are doing perfect performance. They all know you swim down to the intersection, turn right, and you're high and dry. We test this, and this is an example of that behavior, where the animal <coughs> makes the correct choice. That's Patrick's hand. And you can see, after just a moment of hesitation, it reaches the end, and it's high and dry. OK, so we come back 24 hours later, and we test to see whether they remember to turn right. And all the animals, the wild-type animals, the, the uh, autistic-like animals, uh, are performing perfectly. Now we play a trick on them. We change the location of the hidden platform and see whether they can adapt. Now they all start off going to the wrong side. That makes perfect sense because they remember perfectly well where the hidden platform was. The wild type animals eventually learn to perfection that the game has changed and they need to turn left now, uh, or turn right now rather than turn left. But the Timothy syndrome animals never completely learn. In fact, after about 30 trials, 30 attempts at this, they're only working a chance. And you can see this on an animal by animal basis. This is uh, the wild type animals. This is the Timothy syndrome animals. They learn to perfection during the acquisition phase. They remember almost perfectly with only these two exceptions. And on the reversal, all the wild type animals eventually learn to do it the right way. But after about 25 of these, the Timothy syndrome animals is, have still, half of them, are still getting it wrong. So Patrick then came up with this uh, following test of putting a plastic partition here. After all of this work, he put in a plastic partition. And this shows you uh, what one of the Timothy syndrome animals uh, did. <laughs> Notice that it always goes back to the origin. Just like trying to find your car in a parking lot, you go right back to where you came in, it's got to be there, it's got to be there. <laughs> so after four trials, Patrick rescues the little critter and says, okay, you've, you've proven the point. <laughs> and so this was not just an isolated incident. Uh, all of these animals did that. So half the animals uh, in, in this particular circumstance would do this over and over again. So this is an example of incredibly persistent behavior. Uh, and, and remember, they learn perfectly well to perform this task. They remember perfectly well. It's that they're very stereotyped in the way they behave, incredibly persistent behavior. And this is something that parents of autistic kids tell you their kids will, will do. Okay, so let's go on to the next part. And I think I probably should speed up a little bit, although obviously I love the movie. And <laughs> um, finally, uh, if you take a pup and separate it from its mom for about five minutes, it will emit ultrasonic vocalizations. You can pick them up with a microphone. 
in Timothy syndrome animals are quite different than the wild type animals in uh, vocalizing differently. The duration of the calls is only half that of the wild type. It's the same so, pitch. sorry, it's the same frequency. Uh, the calls are relatively similar. There's, it's not really strikingly different. There might be a slight difference in the syllabization uh, that they do. So, uh, th these mice were born from normal mice, and then something was done to them at the laboratory. Is it correct? Um, no, something was done to their genetic code to mimic the human condition. And so the but mouse... But they were born of normal parents, or, or not? No, they're born of uh, one of the parents had the Timothy syndrome. So this is different than the human condition, where the mutation occurs sporadically. We would not be able to have the precision of forcing that mutation if we were simply to, let's say, irradiate the mice. But then we would get a whole random mix. So it's not realistic in the sense that this is an inherited mutation that we are passing on from generation to generation to generation. So just to summarize, the Timothy syndrome uh, animal has a social aversion, a preference for an inanimate objects. It uh, 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 perseverates, it shows stereotypical behavior, and I've only shown a couple of examples of that. We had more. And finally, uh, there is a change in vocalizations, which is reminiscent of a change in communication. In other words, we've recapitulated the classic triangle of results that is, was originally discovered by Leo Kanner and described in 1943. This is the classic autism triangle. Did you check any control behaviors? not expect to change with autism just to make sure the mice aren't just warped? Um, that's a great question. And uh, the most specific version of that is, yeah, um, he wanted to know if we had tested other forms of behavior to know if the mice were just warped. It's a, it's, a, it's a verb I never heard before. But I think I know what you mean. And yes, we did that test. And uh, here are some of the tests. So we looked at the day-night cycle, uh, the uh, diurnal rhythm. And these animals, like graduate students, love to be active in the middle of the night and they sleep <laughs> during the day. And the patterns are virtually indistinguishable. Uh, the amount of time they spend moving is the same. And two tests of anxiety. Uh, one, the light-dark box. Mice prefer to be in the dark rather than in the light, so they're, they're not like humans in that respect. Uh, the two sets of animals are ent entirely identical. Uh, we give them an, an anxiety test where they're allowed to be in a, in a sort of a circular annular arrangement on a raised platform. And uh, typically animals like to be in the closed arm rather than the open arm. They'll only rarely venture out into the open arm and the two groups of animals were completely uh, identical. So in the most important test, the anxiety test, they're the same. And we did many other tests. And I decided to leave this to the end uh, exactly because that is the logical <coughs> question to ask. And we took a lot of pains to make sure that in many other respects, the animals are these animals heterozygotes or homozygotes? They're heterozygotes. If you have a homozygosity, uh, you, you don't do well. You, 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 you don't survive. So, uh, yes? The, the affected mice, the ones that learn to go to the other side, they would not change their behavior. So you don't have a mice will randomly would go once to one side and once to another side. If they learn, the, new, the reversal, they will stay with the reversal. Ah, OK. You mean, are we talking about the wild type animals? Or the no, not the wild <clears throat> OK. <clears throat> so this is one virtue of being compulsive and showing all the data, because I'm going to go back to the slide and let you judge for yourself. OK. So this, which is not shown large enough to be easy to see, is a log of how each of the animals did. Oh, each in them. each of the trials. Oh. So there are 12 animals here, there are 12 animals here, and the white are the, uh, the uh, errors. And the errors pretty much completely die out. And you can see that animals will actually revert back. They'll, they'll do it right, and they'll not do it right. But once they start doing <coughs> it right, then they seem to stick with that. And they remember almost perfectly. And here is a progression with the animals have been arranged according to the order of intelligence, or the, the order of solving this maze in an intelligent way. And you can see that once they've succeeded, they stay successful. There are very few cases where the animals are doing OK, and then they kind of forget. 
And that's a problem to spread. Yeah. Uh, I'll ask him first and then come back to you. Is there a gender bias in female deception? Uh, we haven't seen it. There was something about male. There's a four to one preference for males over females, but in this. So, not like autism. Um, so when you have the Timothy syndrome, so in other words. You have penetration. Yes. The penetrance is different for males and females. Um, there are not enough, there's not enough data in humans to say that uh, with a, a lot of reliability. Yeah. And I'll take you next, and then, and then you. Yeah. What, what is the percentage of wild type mice that uh, exhibit the autistic behavior the way you defined it? Uh, well, that is to say, if you take a thousand wild type mice and have them go through this experiment, some of them presumably would be found to be autistic. Well, um, I happen to show you Patrick's dramatic case with the plastic partition. And this animal here, uh, this one, almost qualified for that. Mm -hmm. right? So what you're pointing out is that there's a whole range of behavior in the wild-type animals. And this wild-type animal did worse than this Timothy syndrome animal. So the distinction between the two is not like this but it's rather like that. that. That the two Gaussians have very, very clearly different means, but the two Gaussians still partly overlap. And that's either due to the fact that our model is not perfect, or it could be an indication that our model, even with these inbred mice that supposedly are very, very, very much alike, they're still individual to individual. And I think that's one of the beauties of showing the slide this way, because it captures the reality that uh, of, a, of a population of animals behaving in very different ways. And, and that could be environment, it could be many other things. So I think you are next. Yeah, well, they have to say what is, what is the actual result, the expression of, of both, of, of both uh, of DNA, so there are two proteins being produced, spontaneously functional and defective? Right, but because this is a, a dominant mutation, the defect, the effective protein, has a very powerful effect of overriding the normal protein. But they produce the heal at the equal rate. Um, they're actually not produced at equal rate because we've left in a piece of DNA called a neocassette that was used to isolate the DNA. And the neocassette, when removed, leaves the animal dead. So you can't do the behavior on a dead animal, so you're perfectly happy to have a volume control to turn down the influence of the mutant allele. And that was part of our, if you like, blind luck that we uh, did went ahead and did the experiments anyway, even though uh, from a molecular biological point of view, it would have been cleaner and tidier had we taken out the neocassette. But when we did take out the neocassette, the animals died. Uh, Evgeny, you had a question, and then we're uh, Coming back to this uh, yeah. great distribution yeah. in, in wild types. Yeah. So um, I'm curious if... Are people uh, pushing their buttons? No, no, no. <laughs> pushing their buttons. Push the buttons, see what happens. Okay. Is it any change? Yeah, it's right here a little bit. I did, I pushed. Yeah, now people can hear. Okay, so, so, so uh, is it inherited now? I mean, it, it seems to be like a dramatic decision. Let's say you say you, you have a, the stupidest mice in the wild type and the smartest one. Yeah. yeah if you... Would they, if you cross them farther down, would they uh, uh, continue their behavior, I mean, in, in their in the, um, progeny? In other words, if this the um, inherited, or it's just a spontaneous change? Okay. Within so, um, at one level, if it was all pure Watson Crick genetics, uh, it would be a very, very boring and arduous experiment. But in this world of environment changing epigenetics and epigenetic marks being passed on, it's not a crazy experiment. In fact, it's, uh, it, could, it, it is potentially a brilliant experiment. And uh, we would simply need to scale up to do this properly because we would probably want to breed two animals like that and two like that and see what happens. And it seems you have enough animals like that. If you have 12 animals and one of them already right. behaves. Right. <coughs> and this goes back right to the question that Michael asked me over tea and other people asked, you know, why the rapid rate and is it environmental and if the environmental is thing, could it be epigenetic? And 
you know, Danny Reinberg at NYU is an expert in this. We, we should be doing something like this. And, and to be honest, uh, this is the first time. I, I don't know, Patrick or Tasha, whether you've ever thought of this before, but honestly, we're so focused on what we're doing, you know. So, uh, I think you're next. Twelve mice, that's what we have in each experiment. We had 12 mice and 12 mice in this cohort, but we reproduced it <coughs> okay. in a different cohort. Yeah. And the white type, when it was forced, they learned it immediately. So, when it's a forest, the, the white type would be green from the beginning. They would never. Yeah, but that's only an end of one. This is just one animal, oh, and so so this animal had a plastic partition because it had, you know, sort of distinguished itself as being dumb, and it it uh, uh, basically uh, went didn't didn't bump its head. It went it went the other. So way. even if he's, it is dumb, it's not too dumb. <laughs> yes, but you need to do more. You need to do more to get it that. I hope you're writing all these ideas. <laughs> we're getting we're getting a free console. Okay, let me go on. So let me go down to here and so effectively what we're doing in this strategy, and I wanted to credit our uh, Columbia colleague uh, Joseph Gogos for this beautiful slide, we're picking out a human mutation from the human population, finding out what the mutation is, putting it into a mouse. Uh, by knocking in that mutation, studying the behavior of the mouse, and eventually we're going to uh, be studying the brain itself of the mouse. And one of the reasons for doing this in a mouse, rather than trying to work in a much more expensive, difficult to study animal, is that we have an opportunity to access the brain, look at the structure of the brain, look at the function of the brain. And that's a perfectly reasonable way to go. And that's one of our objectives, to work with the Timothy syndrome animals and see how different they are physiologically. That has got to be interesting. Uh, we're, I also mentioned this in passing. We have the opportunity to use calcium channel blockers. We can breed these animals with some of the rare, the, the more common mutations that don't have a very strong effect. So now that we're in the sweet spot of producing autism, we can see whether a common mutation makes it worse or better. And this is a common trick that uh, uh, fly geneticists use to work in a sensitized background. So you can think of the Timothy syndrome animal as putting you right in the middle of an autistic spectrum-like set of behaviors and then see what other mutations do. So there are a lot of strategies open to us. But right now, we would like to take advantage of our skills as basic scientists and not as behavioral scientists to look more deeply at what this protein is for, why this protein is important, and I hope you will pay close attention to this because this is work that's not published. We're very excited about it because we think that this channel is also implicated in other diseases and we are starting to understand why. So the trick is to work from the disease gene, not the behavior, but to the signaling network that the disease gene is part of. So this is a set of, this is a Venn diagram describing the properties of autism, schizophrenia, and bipolar disorder. And in a Venn diagram, you have a region of intersection where all three circles is over... Is schizophrenia actually well-defined? What's that? Is schizophrenia actually well-defined in the It has been changing through the time. Yeah, there is a region. Schizophrenia seems to me it's a word. It's not a syndrome, not a one disease. Yeah. Well, some, okay, some people would say autism is actually evolved with time. And so we uh, simply go by what clinicians are currently classifying as that particular disease. Well, this has changed in the last 20, 30 years very much. Right? That's true. But we're taking a snapshot of what uh, autism is considered today. And most of the genetic studies are not more than two or three years old. So everything I'm going to tell you is based on the <coughs> literature coming out in nature, science, whatever, in the last few years. Okay? That's when the powerful genetic tools and the sequencing of the human genome has led to this type of information. So it turns out that at the intersection of all three of these diseases, autism, schizophrenia, and bipolar disorder, there are 
about five genes. And uh, not necessarily at the top, and not necessarily in red, that's my editorial comment, is the very gene that I've been telling you about. And we did not know this at the time that Patrick began his studies on Timothy syndrome. It just drops out of the literature. So I don't understand what you mean by saying there are these genes. Uh, okay. Let, let me there, let me. There are uh, you mean mutations. mutations. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, what I mean is that a group studies thousands and thousands of individuals who have schizophrenia, and they look to see what is unusual about the genomes of those individuals by doing very, very efficient mass sequencing. No, I and they, okay, simple, I'm sorry, I, 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 you're, you're, you're right, I, I misspoke. Okay. Certain genes pop up as being affected. And that doesn't anomalous. mean, and they're, they're anomalous, they, they behave in an unusual way. And it doesn't mean that they necessarily have as much information as we have about Timothy syndrome, right. where we know the actual amino acid change. They don't always know that. They simply know that this gene is a, sus a suspect uh, for being causative in the gene because there is, through the large number of patients, there's an overwhelmingly statistical piece of evidence that that gene is a player in this. And I'm saying that in these three diseases, it turns out that this particular gene, this calcium channel, popped up. Not only uh, it popped up multiple times in schizophrenia, multiple times in bipolar disorder and multiple times in autism spectrum disorder by independent studies. Yes? Do you? And, and, and plunge you. Okay, Michael. Age before you did. Just, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, just to nail it down, yeah. the five genes being in the intersection, as, as Simon said, that they are all mutated? The fact, is that, the fact that they turned up in these studies Turn up in the sense that means that they have to be modified in one modified way. Mutated. And genetically. And in other words, in, in a okay. Watson Crick sense. And now schizophrenia, for example, is, uh, deeply, is closely connected to dopamine, to the excess of dopamine. How do these genes play? It depends on who you ask whether the <laughs> dopamine theory of schizophrenia is the overriding thing or not. And there, the jury is still out on that. Some people think that schizophrenia is due to a malfunctioning of inhibitory uh, neurons. Inhibitory neurons not having enough NMDA, uh, these are all technical terms, of a particular type of channel that's on the surface of the cell that's in normal. So there are many theories. There are many theories. Okay. For example, people okay. who are uh, treated okay. with okay. Dopa. Okay. Michael, you're you're getting you're getting the oh. hook here. Okay. 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 People who are okay. being um, okay. Sorry. Do you have other examples where there is only one gene, like the, the examples that you are the, the Timothy syndrome, where there is only another gene out of the other four that if you can isolate it? Yes. Uh, no. No. In, and in the cases of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. It is not that a single mutation in a calcium channel will produce those, those agents, okay? They've just been implicated. So I'm gonna go faster now. Uh, so why? Why is this particular protein so likely to give rise to multiple neuropsychiatric disorders? Well, let's look at its function. The L-type channel sits in the surface membrane. It lets in calcium. That triggers a lot of biochemistry. The biochemistry is shown by all of these color, colorful symbols, and the biochemistry leads to the activation of expression of genes. The genes sit in the nucleus, and their expression is regulated by proteins that are called transcription factors. They actually sit on the DNA, bound to the DNA, and in the case of one of these transcription factors, the addition of a single chemical group called a phosphate group or a phosphorylation event leads to the activation of this transcription factor, and that causes the genes, the DNA downstream of that transcription factor, to be decoded and made into protein. So this is kind of magic, but it happens all the time in, in your body, that the activity out here 
at the surface of the cell can somehow lead to a change 10 microns away, and that can lead to the expression of genes. And the L-type channel is the special kind of calcium channel that's involved in this process. Other types of channels that Jerry alluded to, the N-type channels that are involved in neurotransmitter release that are modulated by the things that he and Kathy Dunlop worked on, are not so able to do it. It's a special province of the Kechner 1C gene. So uh, this is one of the simplified slides that I put in because uh, Julia was worried that I was going to mess up. Uh, and this is, summarizes why calcium channels are so cool. Neurons fire. They open calcium channels. They allow calcium to come in. The calcium regulates transcription. Transcription regulates the production of proteins. And the proteins go back into the cell and remodify neural fire. So in order for a cell to have homeostasis and to maintain itself, it needs to keep track of how active it is. And the keeping track is done by the calcium channel. Because every time the neuron fires, the calcium channel opens, allows calcium to flow in. And that's why gene expression by calcium channels is so important. So I'm going to skip this. This is just some experiments. I'm going to skip this and say that the reason why the L-type calcium channel, CACNA1C, is so important is because it engages in some beautiful local signal where enzymes that are bound to it, called CAM kinases, uh, actually are in, in, endowed with the ability to send a long-range signal. To the <coughs> now, the next slide uh, reflects a whole lot of work condensed into one slide, made into cartoon form. And I have gotten permission to show this, even though the work is still unpublished, because we're really excited about it. And so this, in cartoon form, is how an L-type channel signals to the nucleus. And the punchline of this is that if you study cell biology and figure out what proteins in, are involved, you can then get lucky to the point where some of the proteins that are involved in the signaling actually turn up in genome-wide association studies as being other proteins that have been implicated in disease. So you can go back and forth between the genome and what geneticists like Wiggler does and physiology, what people like us, we do, and go back and forth between these. And we're now getting to the stage where we can do this in an intelligent way. So bear with me. So here's what happens when a cell depolarizes. First thing that happens is the neuron depolarizes, the calcium channel opens, that hole opens up, and calcium rushes in. The calcium then binds to calmodulin, which is a protein that's been specialized to bind to calcium ions. And in fact, four calcium ions bind to an individual calmodulin. When the calcium calmodulin complex forms, the calcium calmodulin <coughs> is no longer attractive to a harboring protein called neurogranin. And that calcium calmodulin leaves the neurogranin and binds to something else. And that's called gamma cam kinase. That gamma cam kinase gets phosphorylated by other cam kinases, and that leads to the trapping of calmodulin. Uh, attached to the gamma kinase, so that the affinity is extremely high, a dissociation rate of maybe a minute or two minutes. In turn, there is another phosphorylation site on the gamma kinase that regulates the localization of a protein by regulating a signal called a nuclear localization protein. There's another enzyme called calcineurin that dephosphorylates that phosphorylation site. And when it does so, the nuclear localization signal is allowed to act. And that transports the package of calcium, calmodulin, and gamma cam kinase into the nucleus, which is the FedEx event that we've been looking for. The, cam kinase, the calmodulin dissociates. It then binds to cam kinase kinase, which then activates cam kinase 4 which then phosphorylates CREB, which then leads to gene expression. Now, 
This is a long, shaggy dog story that you probably wouldn't believe, except that we have evidence. For every step along the way, the shakiest is the neurogranite part, but every other step has been thoroughly investigated using a combination of methods. And I would argue that it has to be something like this, because the distance from the calcium channel to the nucleus is so far, and calcium by itself won't do it, because uh, that would flood the cell and be toxic. It needs a mechanism like this, and we have worked it out. And the punchline is that if you work out the signal transduction pathway, and then look in the literature, it turns out that several of the, the proteins involved in this pathway are actually implicated in either autism or schizophrenia or both. That holds true for pectin C. It holds true for gamma chemokinase, both in schizophrenia and in autism. It holds true for calcineurin, and it holds true for neurogram. So in studying a cell biological problem, we are actually probing individual players in the genomic investigation that people like Wiggler and others do, and we're actually threading them together in a storyline that makes sense. In fact, we can now start, now that we know this, we know that if we, we, we suspect that a protein binds the calcium, it might be involved in schizophrenia. And a friend of mine, Charles Hofer, I, I told him we were working on calcium nerve. He said, well, have you looked at NED8? Uh, it's an interesting protein I'm working on. OK, so I look it up. And sure enough, you look in the genome-wide association. NED8 is involved in schizophrenia. And so once you start getting knowledge, it snowballs, and you can build up on it. So go back and forth between disease genes, signaling network, backwards and forwards. And this allows physiologists to contribute to the massive effort that's going on with uh, human genetics. And I'd simply like to finish by thanking Jim and Marilyn uh, for their enormous support of the scientific community that fosters the idea that scientists can communicate with each other and strengthen each other's work. Uh, I've met people who I never would have met before. Uh, Mike Wiggler is a very interesting guy, not necessarily the easiest person to talk to, but I've learned how to do that, and he's learned how to talk to me, and that's through the efforts of the Simons Foundation. Uh, we've taken an attitude to broaden our views and look at diseases of the brain as a whole, uh, rather than focusing merely on autism. We hope that by looking at other diseases, we'll be able to bring things back to autism. And finally, you have fostered a kind of sense of communality among the, the group of scientists. People are really honored to come to your meetings uh, and uh, to get support. That's enough? That's enough. Okay. <laughs> okay. Marilyn, he, he doesn't want to hear this. Thank you. <laughs>